OK, well, it's 3 o'clock, so I'll make a start now. So good afternoon, and thank you very much for joining us today. Um, the webinar we'll be giving today is an introduction to survey data on health. I hope you already know that. And I say we because this is a joint webinar with two presenters from the UK Data Service. You can see our photographs up there. We're in different locations uh, for this webinar, so please bear with us a little when we pass um, slides to each other. Um, and I'm Vanessa Higgins. I'm based at the University of Manchester, working on the data service. And my colleague, Deborah Wiltshire, is based at the University of Essex, working on the service. And Deborah is muted at the moment, but um, she'll be unmuted later when she does her part of the presentation. First off, I just need to check that the audio is working OK. So I'm going to do a quick poll with you. Uh, we're going to set that going now. OK, well, 75% of those who have taken part can hear us, so I think we'll, we'll carry on then. Um, OK, so um, that's a slide for anyone who, who said they can't hear us. I'll just leave that hanging for a couple of seconds. There's some instructions. OK, so on to the, the content. So this afternoon, we're going to be looking at the range of health survey data that are available from the UK Data Service for you to go away and use for secondary analysis. So the webinar will consist of roughly a 40-minute presentation, and then we'll have a question and answer session afterwards. So first of all, I'm going to give a general introduction for about 15 minutes to some of the key cross-sectional survey data with health-related content. And then I'm going to quickly talk through some of my own research which uses health data. And the purpose of this is to give you an example of how these data can be used in research, and how lovely the data sets are, really. So then I'll hand over to Deborah, my colleague, who will introduce the health data in the cohort and longitudinal studies. And she'll also provide some, some case studies of use, and she'll cover how to access and find the data as well. And then I'll finish up with some a couple of short slides on handy resources. So it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour. Um, I hope we can cover everything that's needed. We can give you an overview of the key surveys, and then I think the best thing for you to do is go and have a look for yourself, to be honest. So just one last thing to note, that you're, you are all on mute. Otherwise, it could be chaos if everybody was talking at once. So we can't hear you if you do ask questions. So you can type questions into the question box, which is on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, we do have a facilitator here who can answer questions in back directly back to you in the box um, as we go along. But those will be questions, kind of technical questions, rather than questions about the, the health data themselves. So we'll have the Q&A session at the end for that. OK, so I'm going to go straight in to the Health Survey for England. Um, forgive me if I start to use the acronym, acronym HSE throughout this. The reason I'm highlighting this one is because it's one of the most widely used data sets at the, from the data service, and it's an incredibly important survey for looking at changes in the health and lifestyles of people in England. So it, it really informs policy, and it mon monitors the health of the nation through its provision of key estimates on topics such as obesity, smoking, drinking, heart disease, and, and many other things. It's commissioned by the Health and Social Care Information Centre, and it's carried out by jointly by two organisations, the National Centre for Social Research and University College London. It's been conducted annually since 1991, so there's a good time series there. And the latest data from the UK Data Service for you to analyse is the 2014 data. The 2015 data usually comes, well, it, well the data usually comes around March in the following year, so um, the 2015 data, sorry, the two years later it will arrive. So that will be in March 2017. So the current sample size is around 8,000 adults and 2,000 children annually. But that varies over the years. And some years have boosts to increase, increase the sample size of subpopulations. So that, in turn, increases the overall sample size. So, for example, there was a boosted sample of children in 2002, and then there was an ethnic boost sample in 2004. 
So the sample is a complex sample design and it's designed to be representative of the population of England, so basically it's reliable. Interviewers conduct a face-to-face -face interview with all adults within a household that's selected and up to two children. And then if participants agree, there's a follow-up visit from a specially trained nurse to collect data such as blood and saliva samples and measurements such as waist circumference measurements and various other things. So this slide shows that there is a set of core questions each year. Now I say they're core questions but sometimes they do vary slightly. Uh, but Generally, the, this set on the left-hand side um, is in every year. And we also have core measurements in there every year as well, such as blood pressure, height and weight, and as I said, the blood and saliva samples. So, in addition, each survey in the series focuses on a specific health issue. So, for example, in 2014, the focus was on mental health. And I've listed some examples there from from the latest survey, so 2010 onwards. So you can see that there's quite a range of um, additional topics. And as I've said, from time to time, the core sample is also augmented by an additional boosted sample from a specific subgroup. So rather than listing the whole lot, um, I've, I've put two links here, which will take you through to information about the additional modules each year. Also worth mentioning is that researchers can apply for permission to use the blood samples themselves from the Health Survey for England Blood Bank service. So there are about 100,000 blood samples that have been collected from 1994 onwards and are held in storage in a lab, and these are available for people to reanalyze. I mean, it's really for medical researchers um, to analyze themselves, but it's worth um, having a look at that if you're interested. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about the Health Survey for England. Um, I'll move on to the, uh, the Scottish, Welsh and Northern Ireland Health Surveys now. So like the Health Survey for England, these are really important, valuable surveys for monitoring the health of, of the nation. The data for these surveys haven't been collected on a completely continuous basis, so they're not collected every year. Although the Scottish Health Survey has been continuous since 2008 and the Northern Irish one since 2010, although at the moment the, with the, the Northern Irish Health Survey is only available from 2010 to 11 from the data service. So you need to be aware of issues of comparability between these surveys as the questions that are used across the countries aren't always comparable and there are methodological differences between these surveys as well as the Health Survey for England. So, for example, the Welsh Health Survey uses paper self-completion questionnaires for all the individual interviews, whereas the other surveys use interviewers, so face-to-face -face interviews to conduct the questions. Also, none of the, the three surveys listed here have nurse visits anymore, though the Scottish Health Survey does have a really good interviewer-administered biological module that's replaced the nurse visits that it previously had, but yeah, it doesn't have that, um, that nurse visit any longer. So those are the three other three surveys of the nation, really. Okay, so I'm going to do another poll now, just to check you're listening. So I want you to, to answer the question, what percentage of women, adult women, age 16 plus, in England were current smokers in 2014? Don't worry, we can't see your individual answers, so just have a guess if you don't know. This data comes from the Health Survey for England, as you might have guessed. Okay, we've got 60-70% voted, ooh, 85% voted, 90, should we try for 100? Okay, we've got 95% voted, we're going to close the poll and see what the answer was, okay, so we've got, um, well the correct answer is, is 17%, so 41% of you got it right, so well done to you guys. The 35% the of you who answered 26% have the correct answer for 1993, so you're only 21 years old. Um, 
So that's a, a good example of how the Health Survey for England, for instance, provides current prevalence estimates for policymakers, but also how it can monitor trends over time. And, it, and if you wanted to, you could compare that with Scotland using data from the um, Scottish Health Survey, which uses the same question. And you'd find that a higher percentage of women of age 16 plus in Scotland smoke than in England. That's 21% in 2014. Okay, so moving on now. Um, this slide shows a list of some of the surveys avail available from the data service on specific health topics. There are more, but I couldn't list everything here. Um, you can see from the first list, that there are surveys on a wide range of very specific topics, for example, dental health, diet and nutrition, psychiatric morbidity, which is a really interesting survey about mental health. Some of these are conducted annually, others are conducted on an ad hoc basis. Um, some of the surveys focus on different subgroups each time. So, for example, the dental health surveys, um, the, there might be an adult dental health survey and then there'll be a separate child dental health survey next time. And the psychiatric morbidity surveys do this as well. So you have psychiatric, psychiatric morbidity of children or prisoners or looked after children. So they're not always the same each time. Also, not all of these cover the same geographical population. So some are Great Britain, some are UK, some are England only, some are England, Wales, Northern Ireland, etc. So uh, worth checking that out first. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm just going to pick out a few examples. So the Adult Dental Health Survey. So this is carried out every 10 years, and it has data on dental health, not surprisingly. Um, it has experiences of dental care and access to den dental services. And again, like the other surveys that we've talked about, this survey provides important information about the dental health of the nation and um, shows the extent to which health targets, are, dental health targets are being met. Um, another example I can pick out is the National Survey of Sexual Attitudes and Lifestyles, which has been conducted every 10 years since 1990. The main objectives of this survey is to provide a detailed understanding of patterns of sexual behaviour in Britain, and so it includes things like number of sexual partners, frequency of different sexual practices, um, homosexual experience, and it provides data on HIV and AIDS and chlamydia, and because it's carried out every 10 years, it assesses change over time as well. So if you're interested in sexual health, that's your survey. And then another one is the What About Youth survey, which is a fairly new and interesting survey. It's been conducted in 2014, and it was conducted mainly online, although there was the offer of paper questionnaires as well. And this covers just 15-year-olds in England. Um, and it covers a range of health behaviours, things like diet, physical activity, emotional well-being, bullying, drugs, general health. It's a quite a, a wide-ranging survey. And yeah, that's that's quite an interesting one. Um, actually, another one that I haven't listed here is the Living Costs and Food Survey. So if you're interested in diet, that's also a, a good one to look at. Okay, the second list at the bottom, which says surveys with some health content, um, these are surveys that are primarily health focused, but that do have health content and can be useful. This isn't an exhaustive list, it just gives examples. So, for example, the annual population survey, which is primarily a labour force survey, has questions on subjective personal well-being, general health and disability, and it has a huge sample size. So for the personal well-being questions, for example, it has 165,000 people who answer those questions. So it's worth looking at some of the surveys that you might not think have health content. There are also some cross-national surveys with health content. So um, an example here is the European Quality of Life Survey. Um, this one's carried out every four years, and it includes 30 countries, and it includes the UK. It has a target of a thousand people in each country, but in some countries there are more. It examines a range of issues, so things like uh, social economic position, employment, income education, housing, health as well, work life balance, life satisfaction. Um, the health element of it is quite general, it covers general health, long standing illness, visits to doctors, and satisfaction with health. 
but it's um, excuse me, but it's useful if you want to make comparisons between countries. So that one's conducted by European Union body, so I'm not sure if we'll end up Brexiting from that at the moment. So I hope that gives you a taster of some of the more bespoke surveys. Um, I do suggest your next step is to go and have a look yourself if something has caught your eye or if I haven't covered your topic. Uh, Deb Brook, like I said, will cover data access and discovery later. Okay, so I'm going to do another poll. So this poll takes data from the survey of smoking, drinking and drug use among young people in England. So what percentage of 11 to 15 year olds in England have ever taken drugs? In, in, this is from 2014. So if you could vote please. Okay, so most people have voted so we'll close the poll. Okay, the correct answer is 15%. Shocking, isn't it? <laughs> so um, most people thought it was eight. Yeah, forty-six percent. So yeah, it's quite terrifying if you have children in that age range. So although the correct answer is fifteen percent, sixteen percent were, bo were boys, thirteen percent were girls. Um, and the good news in all that is that it's dropped hugely from two thousand and one when this was first measured, and it was twenty-nine percent in two thousand and one. So something's obviously working. The message is getting through somehow. Um, okay. Thank you. Right, so I've just got three final slides before I hand over to Deborah. And this is just to give you a flavour of how the data can be used and the flexibility and the value of the data. So I'll give you a snippet of some of the work I've done working on the Health Survey for England. And this work was done with Professor Angela Dale. So the aim of the research was to promote, was to provide, sorry, an improved understanding of ethnic differences in physical activity, diet, and obesity. So, so why did we want to do this? Well, there had been some exploratory analysis in the Health Survey from the report that had indicated that there are ethnic differences in these three outcomes, and there's been a lot of qualitative work around these issues, but but there haven't been any large-scale quantitative multivariate analysis to examine it in more detail. So we decided to do that. There's a lot of theory around that suggests that there may be a number of confounders behind um, observed differences, particularly in obesity. So, for example, socioeconomic position, um, migration, culture or religion. So we just wanted to explore things a bit further. So we used the Health Survey for England data from 2004, which sounds like very old data, but this is actually the most recent national data on this topic. There hasn't been another ethnic boost on the Health Survey for England since 2004, so we're waiting for one. And there isn't any equivalent data on other surveys either. And the ethnic boost data oversampled people from seven key ethnic minority groups in England. So there was um, Black African, Black Caribbean, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Chinese, and Irish. So the three outcomes we used were Obesity, which was a, a body mass index greater than 30 for adults. Meeting the physical activity guidelines, which at the time were um, five days a week, 30 minutes or more, at least moderate intensity physical activity, and five-day consumption. So we used pretty basic logistic regression models for male and female adults separately. We first ran simple models just using ethnicity and age, and then um, so that we could look at the ethnic differences before accounting for the confounders and then we added in a large number of the explanatory variables to see if the ethnic differences were attenuated. We did actually do a lot more than that but I'm not going to go into everything. So here's the results. I apologise for the awful colours but it's taken directly from the report. Um, so here I've highlighted the results for obesity and for physical activity only. And this is after controlling for the explanatory factors. So as I'm not sure how familiar you are with odds ratios, I will just give you a quick explanation. Um, the white line across the middle here with the value of 1 represents the white reference group. Anything above the line, any of these bars that go above the line is higher than the white reference. Anything below the line is lower. The, the bars here, the black bars, are the confidence intervals, and basically if a confidence interval doesn't cross this white line, it's significant. 
So the left hand side the obese here, right hand side physical activity, um, and we did them separately for males and for females. So the results show that there are still some differences across ethnic groups after controlling for these other factors in both outcomes. What it doesn't show in this chart is that the original differences were attenuated, so the explanatory variables are doing something. For obesity, you can see that for men, um, the, here are the groups along the bottom, the Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi and Chinese men all have lower levels of obesity than the white men. However, the pattern is very different for women, and that's the, the benefit of having the larger sample sizes so you can look at males and females separately. So um, you can see that black African, black Africans are here and the black Caribbean women have much higher odds and the Chinese women have much lower odds than the white women. And for physical activity, the odds of meeting the physical activity guidelines are lower for the South Asian, here we are, sorry, the South Asian Chinese and Chinese women here. So it's all the Indian, Pakistani, Bangladesh and Chinese women all have lower odds of meeting the physical activity guidelines. And then for the men, just the Pakistani and Bangladeshi men have lower odds. So um, this is interesting because it could this physical activity chart could potentially support the theory that there are cultural barriers to physical activity for the South Asian women. However, we have to be careful making that assumption because we haven't directly measured cultural barriers in the data and there are also lower levels of physical activity for Pakistani and Bangladeshi men than for white men. So there's something else going on for the Pakistani and Bangladeshi men. So those are just some examples of the kinds of things that you can do. Um, like I said, the main aim of this is to illustrate what can be done with health surveys and why you might want to use data. I realize I'm running slightly over time, so I'm going to whiz through this. Um, so why use the data? Well, the data is very flexible. It allows you to operationalize your variables in different ways. So for example, the physical activity section of the questionnaire is very long, and it's made up of questions on different types of physical activities, so sports, housework, walking, etc. So the data does allow you to drop or include things from your definitions. So we decided to do another paper to look specifically at sports participation in different ethnic groups. And we also were able to derive an ethno-religion variable to see if being Muslim had any effect on women's sports participation, as the literature had suggested it did. You can also pull the data sets together to increase sample sizes. So you can do that generally with the Health Survey for England, but um, in this instance we did it with 1999 and 2004 because that's when the ethnic boosts were, and that allowed us to do separate ethnic models and to look at change over time as well. The lovely thing about this data as well is that you can do intra-household analyses. So we also looked at parental, the effects of parental obesity, for instance, on child obesity within different ethnic groups. Okay, so um, there's the link to my case study and some publications if you want to know more about this, but I'm going to make Deborah the presenter now and hand over to her. Okay, so while the slides are just um, loading up, I will um, just introduce what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to look at... Um, the longitudinal and cohort data sets. Now we have quite a few of these, so let's just have a look. Okay, now hopefully you should see, uh, let's just make sure you can see the right slide, excellent. Okay, so there are a number of different longitudinal and cohort data sets that we hold, and a lot of them do have some health-related information in them. Now you can see a list of some of the key ones here. I'm not going to talk about all of them because we don't have time this afternoon. I'm going to focus on the birth cohort studies and understanding society. But I just want to mention that you can find information about all of the others on our website. So if you're interested in those, please do pop on to the website and have a look. Okay, so. We have three key birth cohort studies in the UK, so we're really lucky to have such rich sources of data. Now, cohort studies follow a specific cohort of people across time, 
And the idea is that a group of people that are born in the same cohort, and in these cases in the same week, will be exposed to environmental circumstances that are unique to being a particular age at a particular time. By keeping this aspect of the respondents' lives consistent, it removes any cohort effects as a potential explanation for observed differences between respondents. So it allows us to focus on the effects of time and age when we're looking at change. Now, we can also use the cohorts to make comparisons between them. And these are the three key birth cohort studies that we have. So you can see the 1958 National Child Development Study, the 1970 British Cohort Study, and the latest one, which is the Millennium Cohort Study. Now, each one follows a sample of babies that were born in a specific week in that particular year. And then the individuals are followed across their lifetime. And the aim is that this enables us to understand the factors which influence our development across our entire lifespan. Because these three studies started in different decades, using the three in combination enables us to have a look at generational change. So this is one of the additional benefits of these particular studies. All three of these studies have a very strong medical and health focus. So they collect an awful lot of information around these topics. But they also collect a wide range of data on social and economic circumstances. So they enable us to build up a very full picture of people's lives. Now, in terms of data collection sweeps, the rate at which the cohort members are interviewed does vary between the three studies. For example, you can see on the left-hand side the 1958 National Child Development Study had the first sweep at the time the cohort members were born, and then there's been nine subsequent sweeps. And you can see the years and the age of the cohort members here. The next data collection sweep is planned for 2018, and that's when the cohort members turn 60. So already in one study, you can see we've got a picture of people's lives from birth right up to the cusp of retirement age. The 1970 British Cohort Study has had eight sweeps in addition to the information collected at birth. There is one in progress, so the cohort members are currently around 46 years old. And there's one planned for 2020 when they reach 50. The Millennium Cohort Study is obviously a lot newer, and so far we have data available up until they turned 14 years old. And the next one is planned for when they turn 17. So just as they're coming into adulthood. Now, cohort studies vary in the detail of what information they collect. And they will often focus on different topics at different data collection sweeps. And that is determined by what's suitable for the age of the cohort member. But health and well-being is always a central theme. You can see here um, this word map, and this just gives you an idea of the range of different topics around health. So we have the very obvious physical health measurements, so height and weight, information about health conditions, medication, any limiting um, disability they might have. There's also things about vision and hearing assessments that are carried out. But there's also lots of other health-related topics that are covered. So we've got issues of reproductive health from contraception, birth, labor, all the way through to menopause. We've also got a lot of information on mental health and well-being. And that includes some of the questions from the general health questionnaire, which is a standard measure used in very many studies. There's also information on self-esteem, people's attitudes, people's emotions, malaise inventories. So you can see that the definition of health that's used in this surveys are really very, very broad. So let's have a look at a study which has used data from one of these cohort studies. And this is a study um, 
by Kelly, Kelly and Sacker in 2013. And they used the Millennium Cohort Study to have a look at the relationship between regular bedtimes and childhood behavioural difficulties. Now, the studies have a lot of measurements about child development, and that does include behavioural and social development as well. So they use the study to have a look at the impact of cumulative bedtime conduct across early childhood, and they were also able to look at change in conduct between waves and to see what impact that might have. So before I show you some of the results, I just want to ask you, what proportion of three-year-olds in the UK do you think have irregular bedtimes? We're just going to launch the poll. And I'll just give you a few seconds just to have a look and see what you think might be the proportion. Okay, so it's fairly evenly split between 24, 51, uh, no, 14, 20, and 26%. Okay, so most of you have had a chance to vote. So just about half of you actually uh, thought it was 20%. And you'll be pleased to know, if you're in that 50%, you have the answer correct. It is actually 20%. So that's around one in five three-year-olds having irregular bedtimes in the UK. Now, this particular study by Kelly, Kelly and Sackish, found that by studying change in the same people over time um, and making use of this longitudinal data, they were able to see that there's a cumulative impact of irregular bedtimes. So they found that irregular bedtimes throughout early childhood, and that was observed at ages 3, 5, and 7, had a larger impact on behavioral difficulties when irregular bedtimes were only observed at one or two of those ages. So in effect, the longer these irregular bedtimes continued, the more of an effect it had on the behavioural difficulties seen. Now the good news for any parent out there struggling with um, bedtimes is that by studying um, change in the same children over time, they found that changing from non-regular bedtimes back to regular bedtimes was associated with a reduction in these behavioural difficulties. So it seems that the effects of inconsistent bedtimes are reversible, which of course is, is good news for parents. Um, and it also shows that the, there are potential opportunities for interventions. So the cohort studies have been widely used. They're some of the most widely used studies that we hold. And you can see here just a, an example of some of the studies that have found their way into the news. So I'm going to move on now, we'll leave the cohort studies behind, and I'm going to talk about understanding society. Now understanding society, or to give it its other name, is the UK um, Longitudinal Household Survey. Um, now this survey starts with a sample of households. So we're not looking now at people born in a specific week, we're looking at households which are sampled at the start of the survey. And all of the household members are followed over time. So the survey began in 2009, in the January. And the aim of the survey was to replace and build upon the British Household Panel Survey, which you might already be familiar with, um, which has been running since 1991. Now, understanding society allows us to track change, not just at the individual level, but at the household level as well. So we can have a look at what sort of circumstances and key events people experience across their lives and what sort of outcomes or consequences there are from those. We can have a look at people's attitudes and see how they change. We can have a look at how individuals and households might respond to some of the key public policies. And because we follow these same individuals over time, we can also have a look at what changes or outcomes come about as a result of societal conditions changing. 
Now, Understand Society is a multi-topic survey, so it collects information about a whole range of aspects of people's lives. In terms of health content, information on health is collected in two different ways for this study. And the first way, in common with many studies, is through the individual questionnaires. Now, individuals are interviewed annually, so 16 year olds and over are interviewed uh, annually. Children aged 10 to 15 are asked to fill out a paper questionnaire and information on younger children, so children up to nine, are collected by the parents. So in terms of the questionnaire, they, individuals are asked to assess their, their overall health, so do they think their health is good? What is their height and weight? What sort of health conditions or medication do they take? Again, we can see the general health questionnaire measures are used here. And there's also a lot of questions on different health behaviors. So whether people take exercise, what's their diet like, whether they smoke and drink. And also mothers or people who are pregnant are asked whether they smoke and drink during pregnancy. And one thing that this data allows us to do is to have a look at the prevalence rate of different conditions. So I want to ask you now, which UK country do you think has the highest prevalence rate of diabetes between England, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland? Okay, so most of you have had a chance to vote. Um, and I think there's quite a lot of agreement among you that Scotland has the um, highest prevalence rate. So let's have a look at those results now and we'll see whether you're right. Well, actually, in fact, when it comes to diabetes, Wales has a slightly higher prevalence rate. Although Scotland does have the highest prevalence rate of um, high blood pressure. So you can see here the sort of information that we can get from Understand Society. Now, I mentioned Understanding Society collects data on health in two ways. And the second way is through nurse assessments. Now, data collection for this took place between 2010 and 2012. So, a selection of the households were visited by a qualified nurse. The interview took about an hour. And during this assessment, a number of physical measurements were taken. And you can see them here on, in this table. So, we've got height and weight, waist circumference, body fat also measures such as grip strength and respiratory function were taken and you can see the sort of conditions that they were hoping to measure in this table. But also the nurses took blood samples and samples were collected from just over 13 and a half thousand people. And from those blood samples, analytes and DNA were extracted. Now the reason for taken these blood samples was allow the use of biomarkers in health research. And you can see a definition here of what a biomarker is. Now, when we ask people to self-report their health, obviously it's a very subjective measure because it's how they feel about their health. Whereas a biomarker is a very objective measure. So it's a more precise measure, if you like, of health and illness. And it allows us to research not just specific conditions, but also those that might not yet be diagnosed. We can also have a look at pre-disease risk factors. And we can have a look at what sort of treatments are effective, for example. But more than that, it allows us to research how the biological pathways between social factors and our health might work, and how our genetic makeup and our environment can interact. So having biomarker data is extremely valuable in health research. So I just wanted to show you some of the blood analytes that are extracted from these blood samples. Collect some fairly obvious things such as cholesterol and glucose intolerance, but there's also tests for anemia, liver and kidney function, for example. And again, in this table, you can see some of the things that they aim to measure. 
So that really just gives you a, an outline of some of the excellent sources of data that are available in these studies. Please do pop onto our website and have a look at the documentation because that will give you a much better idea of the sheer scale of the information that's available. So I want to just talk about access because hopefully having heard about these data sets, you'll want to know how to access them. The data from all of the studies that we've mentioned, and that includes the nurse data from Understand Society, are deposited with us and can be accessed through us. There are cases where more sensitive data, such as smaller geographical identifiers and more detailed information, such as a full uh, fuller date of birth information will require approval, so you might need to apply for a special license version of the data, for example. There are some more sensitive information which needs to be accessed through our secure lab, and this includes, for example, the linked data to the National Pupil Database. Um, this is um, a countrywide database for, for all pupils, and it can be linked to Understand Society and the birth cohorts. Um, but that must be done within the Secure Lab due to the disclosive nature of the data. If you want any more information about any of those access conditions, then either do ask us at the end of the webinar or pop onto our website and either send us an email or you can find information um, about the access on the website. Just one final note to make on access. I mentioned that DNA was extracted from the blood samples um, in Understand Society nurse assessments. Now, the access for this obviously is uh, very strictly controlled, so you'll need to go to the Understand in Society website to get information about how to apply for access to those. Just before I hand over to Vanessa to talk about some of the additional resources that we have available, I just want to mention the ways of searching for data on our website. Obviously, we've mentioned a few of the fantastic resources, but you might want to pop onto our website and have a look for yourself, because there are over 7,000 data sets now on our website. You can have a look through our key data pages. You can use our Discover and Variable and Question Bank search tools, which are very easy to use. But you can also use our Data by Theme pages. Now, if you're not familiar, this is organized by different themes, including what you can see here, health and health behavior. And that will enable you to find a list of some of the key data sets um, and the most widely used data sets in that area. And also, you can have a look at some existing research in that area. Okay, so I'm now going to hand back over to Vanessa, and she's just going to finish off the webinar by talking about some of the resources that are available. So do bear with us just a second. Hello again. Okay, yeah, I've just got two final slides before we go on to the question and answer session. So this is about the UK data service resources that you can access free of charge. So um, if you want to know more about case studies of, of use with some of these health surveys, you can click on the first link, which will take through to case studies of use. But also, um, some more recent case studies are available from a, a conference that we ran last week, actually, in London, which is the Health Surveys User Conference. Um, really interesting conference where data depositors and data users get together, and we had over 100 people registered. Um, and, and attended on the day. Um, and so if you go on the, our website under past events, the slides from that conference will be there, and really good up-to-date case studies of use from these surveys. Uh, we also have a wide range of other resources. So we have video tutorials, written guides, web pages, and these, the, some of them are specifically help, some of them aren't, most of them aren't actually. So you'll, but you'll get things that may help you with your research and using these kind of data. So things like um, a, a written, quite substantial guide on com complex sample design and a guide on weighting social surveys. And then an introduction to secondary analysis 
as well, which if you've not done it before and may be daunted by it, that might be quite useful. We also have a heap of resources for students. So um, if you are a student or you have students, there are there's a using survey data guide, which is it's aimed at all researchers, but it, it we specifically wrote it for students who want to use data in their dissertations. So that's that's a really good one. Um, we also have lots of advice for new users, and we have help desk and frequently asked questions and things like that. So so go along and have a look at those pages. I have put links through, but you probably find other resources that are helpful too. So all these are free as well. And we also run a training event program. Obviously, you know about that. Um, so sign up to our list and you'll hear more about those events. Now, this is a really quick one to say that there are a wide range of ESRC services, data or training services out there, which will help you um, to, use, to use data and also have a range of other health data, not necessarily survey data. These might be of interest to you. So Understanding Society not only carries out the Understanding Society um, study but has a huge support service and runs training courses and there's an online training course there as well. And then there's the Census and Admin Data Longitudinal Studies Hub, the link there that has some health data in it and provides resources and training. Centre for Longitudinal Studies um, carries out the cohort studies and um, yeah, provides you support training and, and so on anyway. So um, it's worth having a look at some of those websites as well, as well as us. Well.